Okay, we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Bulware. I'm the um, HAA director for this region of the country and uh, located here in Minneapolis. I've been in, in Minneapolis and part of the club for, for almost 20 years now. Um, I wanted to, first of all, we have a wonderful program. It's always a treat when we have uh, someone from Harvard, a professor from Harvard to uh, meet with us. And this is a little bit different format because we also have another guest who's going to moderate the discussion. Uh, so this is how it's going to go after my intro. Uh, David is going to speak for a short period of time, and then we're going to have a Q&A that's moderated by Sylvia Bartley, and then we'll have time for open Q&A from the audience. So I want to introduce our two guests. Uh, the first person is Sylvia, Dr. Sylvia Bartley. Sylvia is um, going to moderate the discussion. Uh, she's a senior global director of the Medtronic Foundation, overseeing employee volunteer engagement for their 90,000 employees. Sylvia is also very involved in volunteer work here in the Twin Cities, as well as nationally. Um, she's also a journalist and an author. She hosts a weekly uh, podcast called Black Leadership Redefined, which is uh, on the African American Leadership Forum uh, website, as well as being um, broadcast at noon every Sunday on KMOJ. Uh, she published her first book called Turning the Tide, Neuroscience, Spirituality, and My Path Toward Emotional Health several years ago. Sylvia graduated from the University of London and uh, she received her PhD or earned her PhD from the Royal London School of Medicine and Dentistry. I would also like to introduce uh, Dr. David Harris. David has pleaded with me to do a short intro, so I will try to uh, to honor that. He is the managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at the Harvard Law School, which he has uh, a post that he's held since 2006. Under his leadership, the, the Institute has created a, a national platform with its uh, Houston Marshall Plan for Community Justice. David has extensive experiences in many facets of civil rights issues from police practices to redistricting and domestic violence. So, um, you know, it's particularly timely that he's here this week while we're in the middle of the David Chauvin, uh, uh, Derek Chauvin trial. And um, we'll get into a lot of discussion around uh, a lot of these issues. He has a PhD in sociology from Harvard University and a BA from Georgetown. Uh, he has served as adjunct faculty at Cambridge College and a lecturer at Harvard Law School. And um, we are very excited to, to have David here and, and get some words of wisdom from him. So without further ado, I will turn it over to David. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I really thank you for this opportunity to, to join you all this evening. Thank you so much, Lauren and Jim. Uh, I look forward to the conversation with Dr. Bartley. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you know, I know the uh, advertised topic uh, that, you, uh, that you saw was uh, from a previous talk I had given. And uh, I think I'm going to shift a little bit from that. Uh, and I've cobbled together some comments to, to try to give you a little bit of uh, understanding of how I see the world and 
in, in anticipation of the conversation that we'll have following my remarks. You know, having said that, you know, I think for me, it, it's really important. One of the things that's really important for me uh, these days is to anchor my comments uh, in, in a little bit of history. And the piece of history I want to talk about is one that maybe we're tired of, but, but we should remember. And, and it's the 1619. A couple of, you know, we, a couple of years ago, we marked this, this, this uh, 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 anniversary of 400 years, and, and there was a lot of uh, conversation and discussion and a lot written about it. One of the things that I want to emphasize, though, what we know is that sometime in August of 1619, <clears throat> a number of captured Africans landed in the British colonies. Uh, we also know that on July 31st that year was the occasion of the first uh, elected assembly in the British colonies. And that, that, that date is marked in history as, uh, and was celebrated by, by our former president. Um, and I want to kind of draw attention to the contrast between the detailed date of that event and the really uh, uncertain date of the landing of, of the Africans. Uh, you know, and this, these, this contrast uh, reveals to us uh, the, the a kind of two things, the, the unimportance of detailed history of people of color in this country and a pattern of exclusionary democracy, because in fact, that elected assembly uh, did not include the uh, enslaved Africans who had not yet arrived. It did not include women. It did not include the native people. It did not include uh, people who didn't own property. And this pattern, the blindness to history uh, about uh, the date of, of when the, when the, the captured uh, Africans arrived, uh, and the exclusion were memorialized in our own constitution and proclaimed in that eloquent and, and eloquently written phrase that we all know and recognize, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. You know, worse than a myth or a mere exaggeration, we the people is what I consider to be our founding lie. Our history has proceeded from there, the same exclusion again rendered by, by law in the Dred Scott decision, which held that a black person had no rights that a white was obligated to uh, observe, recognize, or honor. The legal, that legal doctrine, like the lie of the Constitution, remains embedded, deeply embedded in the institutions and practices of our society, and I would argue in the collective consciousness of the nation, including a legal system based on an unstated but constantly reaffirmed notion that white lives matter and matter more than others. <clears throat> Early in the history of our institute, we observed the 150th anniversary of the Dred Scott decision, and it included a re-argument of the case that was really an amazing event uh, argued by accomplished lawyers before a panel of federal judges presided over by uh, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. But of greater relevance, it was a remarkable event, you know, uh, but of greater relevance for us uh, was that we undertook a, a, a reconsideration of the notion of citizenship 150 years after <clears throat> Justice Taney issued his famous or infamous declaration in the case. And we came to understand citizenship itself as an interaction between membership and participation. The two processes we considered critical for understanding our society with its history of exclusion and impediments to membership having the direct effect on participation by marginalized groups since 1619. So it's critical to underscore that the diminished participation is structured in. It doesn't reflect some lack of civic mindedness of those who don't participate. Indeed, I often comment that it's cynical bordering on cruel to expect those who are excluded from membership to participate in the system that excludes them. Indeed, as counter to that exclusion, the most readily available participation is to vote with one's feet by taking to the streets in protest. Now our streets have been the battleground for the war on crime and war on drugs, and many, if not all of us, know the devastating effects of these wars in terms of mass incarceration. We think about it, we know Michelle Alexander's book, we all understand mass incarceration. But while policing, prosecution, and imprisonment have garnered the greatest attention as signs of the occupation and embattlement, there are other critical ways our communities have suffered. 
characterized as crime ridden, subject to broken windows policing, our young people labeled as super predators, our communities have been starved of resources for decades. Uh, while suburban, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, while suburban communities uh, have been lavished with resources and flourished. And all of this exacerbates the economic consequences of redlining and other forms of economic oppression. Again, you know, this has all been revealed in Richard Rothstein's Color of Law. We all know about it. But the consequences of this are such that in 2015, the Boston Federal Reserve released a study of family wealth in the Boston area. And the results of that study were that uh, white family wealth averaged $247,500 for a white family. And usually if I'm in person, I ask somebody to give me a guess about the black family wealth, but we're not. So uh, the black family wealth was $8. 247,500 to eight. And it's so dramatic that the Boston Globe in reporting the story had to put a little subheadline and said, that is not a typo, 247,000 to eight. But we also recognize that our communities deprived of resources as they are contain resistance all along. That individuals and organizations have fought tirelessly and relentlessly to create alternative pathways for our residents and neighbors. Our communities contain, <clears throat> excuse me, those who have been addressing the issues facing us for decades. And granted, these efforts have been, have suffered from a lack of resources and support, but not a lack of resilience and determination. Rather than thinking about divest, invest, we must emphasize the need for massive investments such as called for by the Kerner Commission more than 50 years ago. And I commend each of you to, to, to to return and take a look at what the Kerner Commission told us. Uh, it, 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 it basically gave us a roadmap that we refused to follow. So we cannot repeat the justice reinvestment mistake of thinking we can merely shift money from one side of the ledger to the other. We must divest, there's no question. Divest from police and divest from the carceral state, there's no question. But the need for investment far exceeds what we can take away from the carceral system. Now, while we recognize uh, Brown versus Board of Education as a landmark decision based on the strategy developed by Charles Hamilton Houston for whom my institute is named, our thinking about Brown has been shrouded by the same fog that covers the constitution. That decision that separate cannot be equal also has unstated parameters. They cannot be equal in this country because of racism. It is racism that makes separate and unequal. It is racism, not something inherent about separation. It is racism, a system that not only denies membership and participation, but also differentially distributes everything, access, opportunity, in addition to education, income, housing, and healthcare. What Brown taught us and the intervening years have reaffirmed and confirmed is that society is not, will not willingly distribute the benefits of citizenship to black and other marginalized populations. We believe it's time to marshal the hidden resources of our communities and exercise our political will on the streets, in the ballot box, and in alliance with others to transform the public policy making framework for this country. We call our approach community justice. It's a simple idea. Uh, promised by the Constitution and Brown, both of which stand as aspirational markers for us, that the voices of those affected by policy, public policy are at the forefront of conceiving, designing, implementing, and evaluating policies to rebuild our communities. And it applies not only to individuals, but to the communities themselves. I would argue further that we have to rethink or perhaps think clearly for the first time about the meaning, the very meaning of the word justice. I ask, I often ask people and I ask you to consider its meaning, what it looks like, its shape and feel, how we know it when we see it. It's not as easy as it seems, I assure you. My only request is that you not incorporate the notion of criminal justice in your considerations, a term that triggers long-standing associations between blackness and crime born from the earliest days of slave patrols and patty rollers in the South, 
that lie at the heart of our social order. Every time we use the phrase criminal justice, we, re we reinforce the association. And I encourage you to banish the term, which stands for social control of our bodies and our streets from use. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. I've wrestled with the term for quite a while and I've come to an operating definition of justice as being made whole. Justice for me means to be made whole. The term flows from the law to be sure, but also from public health. Indeed, it leads us to replace a criminal justice framework with the social determinants of health framework, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and well-being for our communities. Those are things generally captured under, the things captured generally under the term criminal justice on our website are categorized under safety and healing. If you ask me today, I would change that to well-being and healing as safety itself is such a loaded term that conjures policing and enforcement. To be made whole opens new vistas for us, replacing policing, prosecution and punishment with repair and restoration. It does not deny that harm happens, sometimes extreme and violent in nature. But as people ask us to reimagine policing, which is going on almost daily, <clears throat> I must say that we, we should begin by looking back, looking back to a time before policing. You know, when I talk to young people, I often tell them, you know, there weren't always police. <laughs> and it's hard to believe But I say we must do that. Uh, to, to a time when we could address harm and mend the tears in our social fabric through collective supportive action. Difficult, to, difficult as it is to imagine, a world without police and prisons, we must recognize these are relatively late developments in our human history. <clears throat> now, if we adopt the social determinants of health approach to public policy making, we can see the roots of the effects of today's pandemic and past practices. We can think about addressing upstream issues that contribute to the problems downstream. For example, I have a background in fair housing, but find myself at odds with many of my former colleagues who insist that fair housing means creating greater opportunity for mobility. <clears throat> We've all heard it. This is deemed a solution not only for education, but also not only for housing, but also for education. Uh, the logic is that segregation enforced by state action is responsible for our social ills. In this framework, our goal is to create access to the good life lived primarily by white folks in suburban communities. I would suggest that far from a reckoning, far from attacking racism and white supremacy that supports it, policies that insist on moving people or students to proximity with white folks actually validate and perpetuate white supremacy. We must recognize that mere proximity is not equality, whether in a gentrifying neighborhood or a diversifying suburb. We must not confuse opportunity for some with challenging and ultimately changing the structure of inequality. We know what makes for healthy community and the benefits thereof. We cannot move our way out of the social problems we have created by requiring black poor families to relocate or students to ride buses for long periods of time. A racial, a, a racial justice approach must involve a process of redistributing opportunity, not people. Integration can only be an outcome of and not a pathway to racial justice. We've seen this again quite vividly in terms of the recent mass shootings. I know you want to talk about George Floyd, but I want to talk about these mass shootings because here, and, I'm, and to do that, I'm going to read from a letter to the editor that my colleague and I wrote to the Boston Globe, which published on March 24th an editorial day entitled, A New Window for Gun Reform. But this article misconstrued the crisis of gun violence. In particular, we took exception with the statement that in that editorial that, quote, the last mass public shooting in a public place was on March 2020. And I'm sure many of you might think that that's true too. That's the last one you might have heard of. But over the past year, we wrote, if one defines a mass shooting, which there are multiple victims, have been hundreds in recent years, including restaurants, gas stations, bowling alleys, and groceries. 
However, few have captured a national spotlight. Nearly 50% of those uh, of these unprecedented yet unnoticed mass shootings have targeted black people and communities of color. Moreover, according to data released in February by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, young black men and teens were killed by guns at a rate 20 times higher than their white counterparts. Black women and girls are also at highest risk, four times more likely to be killed than white women and girls. Stricter gun control laws won't solve this public health crisis. To dramatically reduce gun violence in the United States, we need a racial, just, a racial equity lens. Empirically supported public health solutions include community-led violence intervention and prevention, living wage jobs and basic income payments, lead abatement, cleaning and greening neighborhoods, improving vacant lots and abandoned buildings, permanent community-based trauma services, mental health care, and direct investment in poor neighborhoods. Yes, limit the weapons availability of the weapons of war, no question. But to achieve lasting reductions, we need a community-led public health approach focused on the root causes of violence, white supremacy and system systemic racism, toxic masculinity, untreated trauma, despair and mental illness, and ep economic precariousness. For me, that more perfect union spoken of in our sacred documents must aspire to that beloved community Dr. King conjured, but never really defined. He left it for us to define and to realize it's such that we the people comes to include all of us. I close with the words of Langston Hughes from his 1936 poem, let America be America again. He opened by demanding, let the dream, let us, let it be the dream, let us be the dream it used to be. But the line is followed by the recurring refrain throughout the poem, America was never America to me. Writes Hughes as he closes the poem, oh yes, I say it plain, America was never America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, David. Uh, you covered a lot there. And uh, we can go deep on many of those issues that you tackled in a short space of time. And so I want to start with this because we are talking to the Minneapolis Harvard Club and you talk about community justice and reimagining policing. And we're at a time where we are in the midst of the trial of Derek Chauvin, who, as you know, had his knee on the neck of George Floyd for actually nine minutes and 26 seconds. And the little bit of the trial that I'm watching because I am managing my emotional health, I am seeing the um, defense doing their best to criminalize George Floyd and really put the witnesses on trial. Now, some may say they're doing their job, but here we have a man who allegedly had a $20 counterfeit note. And for that, he ended up being murdered in broad daylight. So when you think about reimagining policing, and you know better than anyone, the history of policing in America started with the overseers of enslaved Africans. And if you go back from history to where we are today, what do you think it will really take to reimagine policing and us achieving community justice? Well, you know, that's, a, you know, it's a, obviously that's a tough and loaded question, right? So I, let, let me preface it by saying, um, you know, I too, you know, I don't consume a lot of media. I don't consume a lot of news. I have not been consuming the news of this trial, certainly not in moving pictures. I read things, but, you know, I can't bear to watch the things. Um, and the tactic, so, so I'll, I'll comment first on the trial, and then I'll try to answer your question about mm -hmm. how we, um, you know, 
they're, they're, yeah, so, so first of all, I'm in a law school, but I'm not a lawyer, okay? And for whatever Lauren cut out of my intro, there was no law degree ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, but, you know, I, I, I'm left with this, this really stark feeling about the difference between uh, the law and truth. So one of the reasons I don't really want to watch this trial and pay a lot of attention is because I expect them to try somebody else, right? And and for those, and I, you know, as somebody, I, you know, I went to the same high school that Rodney King went to. He came much later than I did, but I was very, followed that very closely. And there was videotape in that case and there were exonerate and there, you know, people got off. And so I think, for us as a nation, we need to kind of start to understand and accept that we know the difference between the truth and the law. And the legal strategy of attacking the witnesses and all of that is just that, it's a legal strategy. It doesn't change our truth. Whether it was eight minutes and 46 seconds, nine minutes or whatever, the truth is that it was a murder, all right? And so starting from that point, um, you know, I think what it's going to take, you know, is, is, is difficult because we, we still have this idea, uh, you know, you know in, in preparation, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about what happened if Chauvin were found guilty, supposing he's found guilty, right? In spite of these defense efforts. What's going to happen is that People are going to point to this and say, oh, the system worked. <laughs> you know, with the system of just, we have a system of laws and a system of justice, and it worked and it resolved this question of this murder. But it didn't. It didn't change the structure of policing in this country. It, it, it will not, this, this case, as tragic and, and, and as profound as it is, will not change the structure of relationships in this country. Um, and, and as to what, what, what it pretends to see, what could change them, you know, I think there are things, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a little bit about some things that are going on in Minneapolis. There, there are things about redirecting um, political voice, I think. I think there's a need for us to think about how we honor the truth that we all see and how we act on that truth, right? And for me, as somebody who tries to um, um, work with and motivate others to act, it, it really has to do with, in this particular moment, how willing and anxious those who want to ally themselves with our fate are about honoring these truths. So, so, so yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm following that old uh, uh, professorial uh, uh, practice of, of answering the question I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that was, that was perfectly fine. And uh, I, I want to extend that a little bit because you talked about uh, lots of activity on the ground in Minneapolis and you are correct. There are several groups coming together, protesting, demanding, not just for the right outcome of the trial, but to your point, for structural systemic change. Policies, they want policy change. Um, they want access and opportunities to high quality education, housing, jobs, etc. So all of those social determinants of health that we know are required in order to live a, a thriving and, and a healthy lifestyle. So I want to take us out of Minneapolis and go into Chicago, Illinois, and I may pronounce it wrong, but Everston is a place where they just approved local reparations in a, in a housing project where they're going to give $25,000 grant uh, as um, down payment to homes. Uh, what is your opinion on reparations? And secondly, is that a good start to having a reparation process in the United States? No, so you're gonna have you know, you're gonna walk me through all these landmines, huh? Right? <laughs> that's a you know, look, that's a tough one, and I because I so 
first of all, so let me, a couple of things. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm fascinated that, you know, so our, our project, we have this project we call the Houston Marshall Plan for Community Justice, and it's designed to rebuild our communities in the aftermath of the war on crime and war on drugs, right? Uh, you know, and we've had it for six or seven years. And, you know, if you think about its logic, it, it is a call for reparations, right? Uh, you know, because reparation, it's, it's kind of based loosely on the, on the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan wasn't reparations because they were our allies, but it, the notion of repair, it was the notion of repair from the harms of war, right? And, and our position is that, that, that our communities were ravaged by these wars and we need to devote the resources to rebuild them. And I, I say that because what's fascinating to me is that, uh, you know, the R word we can now mention in polite company, right? Because two years ago, you couldn't say reparations out loud and, and, and not be hooted off the stage. But now it's part, of our, it's part of our vocabulary. And as you say, Evanston and several other, Providence, Rhode Island is considering it. Uh, and several universities have been engaged in it. To the particular, so, so I'm reminded and I always have to kind of pay tribute to the founder of our institute, Charles Ogletree. Charles Ogletree uh, was, a, was, was a, a, a linear successor to Charles Hamilton Houston and was a, 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 a chief litigator of the, of the 20 and 21st centuries. And Ogletree was involved very early on in, in the movement for reparations for the survivors of Greenwood, of the Tulsa massacre. And as I've been thinking about and talking about reparations, <clears throat> I've gone back and I've looked over some of Ogletree's comments. You know, and Ogletree uh, gave a talk at Harvard, uh, you know, back in the aughts, 2007 or something. He was talking about reparations and, and, he, and he was very careful. He said, you know, listen, I'm not here to, for my check, he said, you know, and, and all of the lawyers who are working on this case are doing this for free and, and they're not in it for checks. And all you sitting out there with your Lexus and your Mercedes and all this, you don't want a check. He said, I'm concerned about the bottom stuck. That was the phrase he used. I, I love that phrase. You know, Ogletree didn't have any pretenses, right? You know, and he talked about the bottom stuck. And what does he mean? What he meant was, uh, if we're going to talk about actual reparation, financial reparations, right? I think he was he was concerned about targeting it. Now I know the Evanston case is 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 trying to target the the reparations to the harm that was done around housing issues, right? So, so on some level, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, on another level. To me, that sounds like a settlement. That sounds like, you know, if you sue somebody and they've done something wrong, uh, you know, th then you enter into a settlement, right? And that settlement is designed in some ways to make you whole from that particular thing, right? So when you, you sue somebody, you know, these, these massive suits, you know, and then they, they distribute. Reparations itself, I think, has to has to carry with it some form, has to A, start with a reckoning and B, carry with it some form of permanent structural change. I think, because we're talking about repair and repair is, is remember, not, not only making whole a person from harm, right, but also a community and, 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 and curing curing the ills that are larger than individuals. Um, so I think it's, a, I think it's, you know, I think it's a step in the right direction. I think it's a fascinating development. You, you know, what worries me about it in some way is, um, kind of the extent to which there's going to be real structural change as a result of it. Um, and, and, and again, I mean, I'm, now, now, you know, I'm, I'm pondering it as I talk. I mean, and I'm, I'm also concerned uh, about, about the need for, for this kind of national reckoning. So to tell you the truth, like, 
and 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 these kind of the, the question of these episodic piecemeal forms of repair uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, and and so I mean and so it's, it's, I mean I'll, I'll leave it at that but I you know I, I'm encouraged by it I think it's fascinating I think it is taking things to a much more real step th than than just talk uh -huh. I mean, I'll, give, I'll just I'll, I'll finish with this I'm sorry the, the, you know, I'm a graduate of Georgetown University. I, I, I assume many of you un, know about Georgetown University's painful, painful uh, uh, relationship to slavery, right? And that the Jesuits in the 19th century sold 272 enslaved people uh, uh, south in order to sustain itself. Without that sale, there would be no Georgetown University today, right? And for many, many years, uh, uh, Georgetown maintained a position that, that all of those enslaved people had gone south and died, right? Which was, which was tragic, but, but was kind of end of story for them. Well, it turns out, of course, they, that they didn't die. Not only didn't they die, but they have thousands of descendants at this point, right? And there's a guy named Richard Cremini who, who has done all this work on, on this, and, and I, he, he's a fascinating guy. Cremini's argument about reparations is that reparations can be nothing or everything. And on the nothing end of the spectrum is kind of like creating a day or a plaque or giving an award, you know, or something like that. And on the everything side, it would be, in Georgetown's case, liquidating all of its assets and distributing them to all of the descendants, right? So he always says, you know, th the fact is, where, where are you on the spectrum between nothing and everything? And I would say that Evanston is moving toward everything. It's moving in the right direction, you know, because his argument is that reparations must change the material circumstances of people. Mm -hmm. And and it's fascinating, um, David, while I listen to you, um, because in the United Kingdom, in 2015, the UK government paid its last check to owners of enslaved Africans in the United Kingdom. And I want to repeat that, that's 2015. And so it meant good taxpayers like myself was paying reparations to descendants of in, um, owners of enslaved enslavers right. in, in the UK. So you started off by saying 1619, you know, captured Africans arrived in a British colony and that everything is kind of built on a lie. I, I say it was built on denial, but they can do things when they want to. Granted, it's a different country, but this has been going on for, for decades. And I think it's... Um, Anyway, I'll keep my opinions no, to myself no, about what I think. No, no, is. no. I think we're having a conversation. I'm interested. I mean, this is this is important, you know. Uh, well, I think it, it, I think it's um, um, it, it gets the pit of my stomach that people, uh, British citizens, are paying enslaved African owners right. are, are, are reimbursing tax money. It's like you're reimbursing them for your own freedom, right? right? 2015. So what my point is that it can be done if people want it to be done and they're dragging their hills and making every excuse possible and starting with piecemeal options when it comes to descendants of enslaved Africans, whether you're in the UK or in America. Now, let's go back and talk about, you know, systemic racism and uh, Harvard is a very prestigious uh, university and I do recognize that they re previously hired uh, a DNI a leader to really look at their diversity and inclusion strategies. And there's a little bit of a history there with enslaved Africans as well. There's some couple of campaigns or um, uh, situations going on there with Harvard with people wanting to reclaim their photographs and some activities that the uh, Harvard student publication, uh, the Harvard Crimson just published on its history with enslaved Africans. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Because people look up to Harvard as a leader in the education space and a leader in the world. And I really would like to know how Harvard is going to lead in this space, particularly as we are living through this racial reckoning in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. Now you can put me on another spot, right? 
That's what they don't pay me to do. Uh, this is, this is, this is, <laughs> these are Harvard alums we're talking to here. Um, I, 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 to tell you the truth, I'd be really curious what, what, what some of our, what our audience members think of this, but uh, uh, and maybe in the Q&A, they'll, they'll chime in a little bit. Um, I, I, I am not comfortable with the way the university is responding. Uh, I, I think, and, and this isn't, you, you know, I think Harvard and, and, and all institutions really take great care to be responsible and thoughtful and, uh, uh, and, and intentional. Um, but, you know, you raise the question of the daguerreotypes, and, and I'm actually very concerned and, and, and engaged there. And, and that whole, that, that, that question I raised about the difference between the truth and the law actually came out of my analysis of the case over the daguerreotypes, mm -hmm. right? Because you have a situation in which a descendant, you know, you talk about paying for this, you know, in which a, a, the descendant of an enslaved person whose photograph, I don't know, I, I hope most of you have seen this photograph because it's a photograph of, of a fairly emaciated man stripped, posed in front of a camera for Louis Agassiz and his eugenics and racist science, right? Uh, and this photograph is used in, for educational purposes and all kinds of other things. And it's her ancestor. It's her family member. And, 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 and the way she knows it's her family member is because there are these stories that have been passed down generation to generation about Papa Renti, mm -hmm. about the person depicted in that photograph. Now the law says that a person doesn't own his or her image and therefore Harvard has no obligation to give her control of it. Well, that's counter to the truth. The truth is that that image was stolen. The truth is that that image was taken of an enslaved person who did not have a choice to be photographed or not photographed. Right? And so, so I don't think that that portends well of, of how we as an institution are going to proceed in our proceeding. Uh, and I know, you know, we have a commission, you know, we have, we're studying it. We got five thousand, five million dollars, put five million dollars into studying Harvard's legacy with slavery, right? So I, I mentioned earlier, can I share, can I share my rock? Yes, please do. And, and while you're sharing, I do want to say that it was not just of uh, Papa Renti, but also his daughter. His daughter Delia, his daughter Delia, yes. Yeah, yes. and the photos, if everyone have not seen it, is just awful. Oh, it's, you know, and, 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 and to think of using it as a teaching tool, right? Right. I mean, and, and if you can imagine, I mean, the, imagine it were your great, great, great grandparent and aunt. And, um, they were, and he, Agassiz was using it to prove uh, Africans were inferior. Yes. Uh, subhuman. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, you know, medical racism. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's still in a if I understand correctly, David, it's still in a Peabody Museum in Harvard. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, and it's still under the museum's control. And and yeah. um, and you know you know and 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 it, well, we, I won't go into the details of it, but yes. Um, so I want to share with you. Um, this photo. Th this is a photo <clears throat> of what I call the slave rock. This is a rock on, and it reads, the, the inscription reads, in honor of the enslaved whose labor created wealth that made possible the founding of Harvard Law School. 
may we pursue the highest ideals of law and justice in their memory. Now, now this is my institution's reckoning with, with its past. Now, I want you to see that this is a, I have a dog, you might've heard him barking. My dog would raise his leg on this. And somebody just dumped their trash on it. That's why I took this a picture. Somebody just dumped some trash on it. This it, it, it is Harvard Law School kind of acknowledging its past. I'm not to say to you that this is on uh, Chimini's uh, nothing end of the spectrum. Because the people who had been enslaved had names, right? They had names, but there are no names on here. Right? So, uh, you know, th these, you know, you know so I don't remember, I don't, I've, I've talked so much, I don't remember the actual presenting question here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but I do think that, that, that we're going to, all of us, I mean, starting with us at Harvard, and in the country, the, the reckoning requires a great deal more than, than we've been putting up right now. And it's gonna be a great deal more than a guilty verdict coming out of that courtroom in, in, in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. It's gonna be, be more than that. Mm. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I wonder when we will get to this place of having community justice and all communities thriving and striving irrespective of where they live or who they what, what what they look like and you know I do think it's um, up to us to also change the narrative when we talk about white supremacy like we're seeing through the trial the somebody murdered somebody else and now it's all about the victim and putting a victim on trial when we talk about racism it's typically up to black people to own that and educate people and say well it's because I am black that this is happening to me. We need to change the language and say no, because of white supremacy and racism, this is happening to me. Uh, you know, and I think if there's a call to action uh, from today, it's everyone playing a part in really having the uncomfortable conversations <clears throat> and changing the narrative. And so we only have uh, eight minutes left for this session. And I do want to open it up for questions. I recognize we've gone deep and we can go deeper and we can talk for many more hours. But I would love to hear from some of the participants. One, to hear your perspective on what was discussed. And two, to see if you have any questions uh, for David directly. And you can either um, put a question in the chat box or raise your hand and we will assist in unmuting you and you can answer that question directly. While we're waiting for that, I want to thank you both for uh, such an interesting conversation. Uh, we could have gone on much longer, but um, let's see if we have any questions. And if not, I have a couple. Why don't you go ahead, Lauren? I'm keeping an eye here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, the mention of Charles Ogletree. I actually went to Stanford with him. So. Oh. Yeah. I love Stanford. Yes. So, you know, you know, that's his love. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he's a, he's, even back then, he was a force to be reckoned with. So, no. No. Um, good old Charles. No. Um, I wanted to see if you had a, uh, an opinion on the inf infrastructure plan that uh, Biden is proposing. And is that going to help? to improve uh, conditions for the African-American community. So, you know, I have to say, I, I can't believe I'm gonna say what I'm about to say, um, but, but, but I am so impressed by that initiative for this reason. Uh, probably 10 years ago, uh, you know, in fact, you know, in the middle of in, when, when, when Obama was thinking about stimulus, I took a position that we needed to be 
investing in social capital in, in our community. We needed to invest in the social infrastructure of our community. So we needed to be building daycare centers, elder care centers, schools in our communities, that we needed to recognize that it was more than roads and bridges that, that, that make us, that, that, that create the fabric of our society right? and, and that make us strong. And you know, I haven't looked. I haven't looked at the at the. I haven't dug into this proposal, but but the the, the way I understand it is that it's starting in that direction and and, and understanding the need to invest uh, in the kind of uh, uh, social infrastructure that we need to restore our cities. And when you were speaking earlier, Sylvia, I mean, I kind of you know one of the things one of my talking points you know until this. You know, last year was that we were able to to create trillions of dollars out of thin air to address the pandemic. Out of yeah. thin air, think about it. we did. I mean, we just boom. You know, by even as close to bipartisan as we could. And my my position was, if we can do that, then we can do reparation. No. If we can create out of thin air, then we can do that. So we're not quite there yet. Uh, but Lauren, I do think that, you know, and I think, you know, what's, what's interesting to me is that the administration seems willing to have this fight. Right. And again, you know, like I'm not, I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a cheerleader for Joe Biden or anything, but, but, but there's something about this that I find actually encouraging. Um, Excellent. Yeah. That's really good. And, you know, I do want to also ask you, David, you know, we talked about all the challenges and the persistency of, of racism and the impact that it has on, uh, in particular, African-Americans. You know, as we bring this to a close, I would love for you to leave us with what gives you hope. As someone who has studied the past and obviously live in right now in the present, where, which parallels the past in some instances, what gives you hope and what gets you out of bed in the morning, fired up to carry on doing what you're doing? Sometimes it's hard to have hope. Just I'll, I'll start there. Sometimes it's hard to have hope. Um, but I will tell you, there are a couple of things. You know, we just showed a film last night about James Lawson, right? Uh, who, who was, who, who really was responsible for introducing the notion of nonviolence to Martin Luther King, right? And who built a career in, non, in nonviolence. And uh, as part of that, we had, a, we had a discussion like this afterwards. I had a couple of colleagues from the Divinity School in that discussion. And we were, we were actually wrestling with that very question. How do, we, how do we sustain ourselves going forward? And, you know, one of the things that gives me hope is the phenomenal resilience, I have to say, I have to be, I mean, of Black people. And this came out of this conversation last night with these people thinking about and talking about <clears throat> how our ancestors struggled and survived and had hope. Right? And, 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 you know, this was, this, was, this was couched in religion last night, you know. Um, but that, that, that I, I do believe in, 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 this, in that there's a kind of inner strength that, that maybe comes from hardship, but I think also comes from uh, ancestral heritage, right? That this is who we are. Um, but, in, but in practical terms, there, 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 there are two other things that, that, that really practical things. I've, I have a great deal of hope and confidence in young people today, right? I think young people today, <clears throat> They, they know a lot, they have a lot of information and, and they're impatient. And they know the difference between truth and law, right? 
Uh, and I think, you know, two weeks, two last week, Boston got its first black woman mayor. A woman named Kim Jenny was sworn in as the mayor because Marty Walsh left for Boston. She was sworn in by a black woman named Kim Budd, who is the chief justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And presided over by Rachel Rollins, who is the black DA of Suffolk County. And as a colleague of mine, Rasan Hall said, it was a phenomenal thing and a lot of the hope has to do with black women leading the way. You know, and, I, and I look to you and I look to, you know, and, and, and it is true, you know, because part of what we have to, you know, you look, you know, it's, 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 it's misogyny, it's racist, there are lots of things that we have to address. And I think that, the, that historically black women have been uh, the strength of our movements, the strengths of our families. And if you look around today and you look at who's leading and who's innovating and who's making change, it's a lot of black women. So between young people and black women, you know, I feel that we have the makings of real change. And that's, you know, I mean, and, 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 you know, and, you know, and we have to, we have to anchor it in something like that. We have to understand and have faith in something. And those are two things that I, I actually have faith in. And I, I love that, David, and that's the perfect way to end, you know, anchoring on the strength of black women. Uh, and if I may add to that, ensuring that black women have the resources and the support and good emotional and physical health that they need in order to move everything forward. So this has been a really excellent discussion. Um, we are at time, Lauren. So uh, I want to thank David very much for your wisdom and your insights and, and for keeping it real. The questions weren't loaded, they were just real questions. <laughs> because sometimes it's, it, you have to ask the uncomfortable questions in order for us to have a real conversation. So I appreciate you, David, very much. Uh, and thank you to Lauren and the Harvard Club for inviting me to help facilitate this very critical conversation. No, well, thank you all for having me. It's really, it's really been a delightful, and I, you know, I wish we were in person, but now I'm starting to see some of you, and it feels, it, it's really good. And, yes. Uh, you know. Well, we'll have to invite you back when we can meet in person, <laughs> but this has been uh, wonderful. Really appreciate your candid comments, and um, I learned something, and I hope everybody else did. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, We'll see you at our next event.